Many years ago, I was teaching kids' church, and right in the middle of this Sunday morning kids' church, I heard a plane fly right over the church. And I mean, it was low. When I, I thought that was it, it would be gone. But then here it came back again, just flew right over the top. Then it occurred to me what was happening. This was a, a, a low flying plane uh, dusting the fields, a crop duster dusting the fields, which is nothing unusual. We never had it happen on a Sunday morning at church. And as I was trying to teach, I looked at those kids and, and they were trying to peek out the doors and out the windows. And I finally said, I said, are y'all listening to me? And they said, no. I said, would you rather go outside and see the airplane? And they said, yes. And I said, me too. And we all ran out uh, the door and stood in the parking lot and watched this plane fly back and forth uh, over the church. And I know it was disrupting the adult church as well. You know, I was a real spiritual giant back then. I chose airplanes over Jesus. But it was so obvious that something else had our attention. I've got to admit that I feel that way sometimes. That I feel like something else has my attention. Uh, that there are low-flying planes competing with my attention that should be on God. Sometimes, now as a preacher, sometimes it's hard to write a sermon. Sometimes it's difficult. It, it, it's not the difficulty of the subject. It's just that it's hard to get into the right frame of mind, to get the heart in the right place. That can happen to a preacher for a lot of reasons. It could be something going on in his own personal life. It could be something going on in the church that makes it difficult. It could be something happening in the world. Or it can be the time of year that it is. And that's kind of where I'm at right now. As a preacher, I'm in one of those kind of in-between times. You know, it's December 27th. You know, Christmas has just happened. We've been talking about Christmas and building towards Christmas for weeks and weeks and weeks. But then Christmas has just happened, but it's not the new year, and I'm not ready to start my new series of, of what we're going to be preaching on through the year. So you find yourself in that in-between place. Now, I've got to say this to you. It may not appear this way, but I have never gotten up to preach, to teach for you with the thought in my mind saying, well, this is good enough. This will get us through the week. Now, like I say, you may hear some of my sermons and say, boy, I don't think Greg put much time into that. I don't think he uh, prayed about that very much. You, and that's up to you. You decide that. But I can tell you, I've never gotten up and said, this is just good enough. But I want to be honest with you today. On this December 27th, this in-between time, I've been having a hard time getting motivated, deciding what to speak about, getting excited to speak about something. It's my last sermon of 19, or, or 2020, so I should say something meaningful, wouldn't you say? But that's part of the problem. 2020 has been a low-flying plane that so easily takes our attention off of everything. It's been such a challenging and difficult year for everyone, not just me, not just in the church, but really for the entire world, it's been a difficult year. I read part of an email uh, ad addressed to the employees of one of our uh, hospitals in the area. And it was an email to the employees and, and it said, you know, that just recognize that this has been such a difficult year. And financially, some of the benefits have been cut. Uh, you know, it was just a hard, hard year. But this is what got my attention. One paragraph said this. It says, moving into 2021, we have reasons to be hopeful that next year will begin to turn us and the world back around. We are seeing this through the early vaccine administration. There is hope, excitement, and optimism all around us. And that really got me, really got me thinking, got me, me uh, fired up. Hope, hope is a theme of life. It's not just the hope of a Christian. Hope is a theme of the world. But you know, to appreciate hope and to appreciate looking ahead, what makes us appreciate that? Now, you might be saying, well, Captain Obvious, hope is a wonderful thing. I know that. I know that. But what makes us appreciate hope? 
it's very obvious that to appreciate hope, we must realize the condition that we're in, that things are not great, that we are looking forward to something else. Between this, this idea, this email, and this thought of hope and looking ahead to 2021, and then after reading Luke this year, you know, leading up into Christmas, my mind just kept going back to two people, Zechariah and Elizabeth. Luke chapter 1. Now, I, we're gonna, that's what we're going to do today. I'm gonna, uh, we're going to spend a, all of our time in that one chapter. So go ahead, uh, pause the TV, whatever you got to do, and get your Bible. Because it's not going to be on the screen. We're just going to work our way through this, this story of Zechariah and Elizabeth. Now I'm going to begin with Luke chapter 1, starting with verse 5. It says, in the time of Herod, king of Judea. Now we would just keep reading, but we've got to stop right there because just those few words points out the hopelessness of the situation. These people living in this area to live under the reign of, first it was Rome, but under Rome they had even a local king that they had to listen to. He was appointed by Rome. And Herod was not a good king. He was a ruthless king. He cared nothing about people. And this was through a period in history where God was totally silent. A silent God. No prophets, no angels, no one had come to address the people. 400 years. Let's keep going. It says, In the time of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife Elizabeth was also a descendant of Aaron. Both of them were upright in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commandments and regulations blamelessly. Well, sounds good. What could possibly go wrong? They have to have a great life, don't they? To be a priest and both of them be followers of God and so devoted to him. What could go wrong? Verse 7, But they had no children, Elizabeth was barren, and they were both well along in years. This right here is a description of godly people living in a bad situation. No children in a culture where children meant everything. And the, having no children and the circumstances and their age had robbed them of any hope that anything was ever going to change. You know they wondered. You know they wondered at times, God, where are you? Why are you silent? Not just silent to our nation, but silent to us. Our nation may have sinned, but we followed you faithfully. Where are you, God? They probably have been hopeful their entire lives up until a point, and then they gave up hope because experience said it's too, we're too old for God to fill this void. Now, Zechariah was a priest, and it says that at this point, he was serving in the temple, in the inner part of the temple. Luke chapter 1, starting verse 11, says this, Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and was gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. What prayer? What prayer? It doesn't tell us about a prayer. We see what that is. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you are to give him the name John. This tells us that this is something that had been on their hearts and minds. Because he the angel says, God is answering your prayer. He will bring you, he will be a joy and delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. And the next verses go on and describe what John is going to do, what he will be like, how he will turn the nation towards God. It's just, it's a tremendous uh, um, essay of what God prophesied that would take place in the life of John. And you really, really need to read it for yourself. But this is such a special message for Zechariah because he's never heard those words. You're going to be a dad. You're going to have a child. It's a boy. He's never heard any of those things. 
You know, before we can appreciate rain, we must understand or experience drought. Before we can understand the blessings of good health, we must understand, experience, or see it in someone we love, the effects of health lost. Before you can appreciate the joy of life, you must have watched someone that you love very much lose their life, and you experience the pain of death. You know, those who are recovering from, recovering from some type of addiction, no matter what it is, they understand something that we don't. They understand the pain of it. They understand the loss that that addiction had brought to their life. They understand the toil that it has taken, or the toll it has taken on them. And they never want, a recovering addict never wants to go back to that. They can remember all of the bad, the pain, and they do not want to go back to that. They understand the need for community. They understand the need to rely upon each other. They need, they understand the, the, the importance of accountability, not only to God, or as many of the treatment plans say, to a higher power, but an accountability to each other and the sharing of your burdens with each other. They understand something because they know the other people that they rely on have gone down the same road and can understand. Let me say something to you. We're all recovering addicts. We're all recovering addicts to sin. And all of us Christians need to learn the exact same lessons. We need to remember the pain and the toll it's taken on life because of the sin in our lives and what hurt has been brought, not just to ourselves, but what we've caused the hurt to other people. We need to understand the sacrifice that God made through giving His Son to come to this world and to live and to die for our sins. We must understand that we never want to go back to that. We never want to take for granted again the blessings in our lives. It's sad to say, but to appreciate the good, we have to see the bad. Back to Luke chapter 1. Verse 18 says this. Zechariah asked the angel, How can I be sure of this? I am an old man, and my wife is well along in years. And this is it. This is us all over, isn't it? Don't we do this? We want something. We pray for it. We believe something. And then when it's going to come true, we doubt it. We doubt the, doubt the goodness of the one giving it. Experience teaches us a lot of things in life, but it's also possible that experience teaches us to doubt the good, to doubt that there's ever going to be anything good happen again. You know, there's been a term that we have become uh, accustomed to in like the last four years. Fake news. Fake news. Now, I'm not going to talk about politics here. I just want to think on that phrase, those two words, fake news. It's something that's news, but you, you can't believe it. It's just, it's something that's made up. It's got an agenda. It's got one side to it, and it's not the full truth fake news. I'm not talking about the political side of things. I'm talking about the spiritual fake news that we tend to believe. This is hopeless. It's never going to get better. Fake news. God doesn't care one bit what happens to me. That's fake news. This is God's fault. A loving God wouldn't do this. Allowing God, a loving God wouldn't allow this to happen. Fake news. I don't need a Savior. I'm as good as anybody else. Just leave me alone. Fake news. Has life affected you that way? Has 2020 just beat you up so much to a point that you're believing these lies, this fake news? Back to Luke. Verse 19 says, The angel answered, 
I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. And I have been sent to speak to you and tell you this good news. Gabriel is saying, are you kidding me, Zechariah? I am Gabriel, sent from God for you. And you're going to doubt me and God? And he goes on and he says, And now you will be silent and not able to speak until the day this happens, because you did not believe my words, which will come true at their proper time. And that is exactly what happened. If you read, you're going to find that Zechariah from that instant on could not speak. He could not make words come out. And to communicate, he just had to make signs and, and, and motion or to write down so people could understand him. Nothing would come out. Nine months. Five of those months, those first five months, Luke tells us that Elizabeth went into seclusion. She went into quarantine. You might say, why? Luke 25 says this, The Lord has done this for me. This is Elizabeth. She said, In these days he has shown me his favor and taken away my disgrace among the people. We are left to wonder why Elizabeth did this. Why did she seclude herself, quarantine for five months? Was she just being careful? Uh, did she want this just as a special time between her and her husband and God? Did she want to avoid the questions and the looks from the townspeople? Was it possible? Just possible. We're not told. Is it possible that she had been here before? And it shown the excitement of being pregnant, but it never went to full term. And she just didn't want to go through that heartache again in public. We're left to wonder what it was, but we do know this. It was a time of waiting. For Zechariah, it was nine, mo nine months of silence. For Elizabeth, it was nine months of waiting for this new life to come into this world. It was a waiting game, but it eventually, the day eventually came. Skipping down to verse 57, it says this. When it was time for Elizabeth to have her baby, she gave birth to a son. Her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown her great mercy, and they shared her joy. On the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child, and they were going to name him after his father, Zechariah. Now, this is, all, this is all custom and tradition of the people. This is what they do. But his mother spoke up and said, No, he is to be called John. And they shocked everybody. They said to her, there is no one among your relatives who have that name. Then they made signs to his father, to Zechariah, to find out what he would like to name the child. They were just going to go right over top of Elizabeth here and say, she's, she don't know what she's talking about. Zechariah, you tell us what the name of the child. He asked for a writing tablet. And to everyone, everyone's astonishment, he wrote, his name is John. Immediately his mouth was open and his tongue was loosed and he began to speak, praising God. I love Luke chapter 1. And I would like to just ask you to go back and read all of Luke chapter 1 and just see this wonderful story unfold. Now through this story, I want to draw just a couple of conclusions as we finish things up here today. Wayne Stiles was writing and he tells the story that, uh, that he began to observe and take notice and, uh, of how much of his life as he drove to work was going on tollways and paying tolls. And he said, I got tired of paying tolls, so I decided I would take the, the access road, the, the roads that went around. But he said, then I found that I had to stop at stoplights and I could either choose to pay with money or pay with my time. And he said, as he observed and tried to take this all in, he says, the worst was having to stop at the stoplights, and especially when no one was coming the other way. Because traveling to work, he would travel very, very early in the morning, even before daybreak. And maybe you've experienced this before. You pull up at a stoplight, and it's red, and, but there's no one coming, no one in sight. And those moments that you sit there just seem so painful. 
And he said he would sit there and wait. He wouldn't run the red light because he knew there was a purpose behind it. He couldn't see it right then, but there was a purpose behind it. And he said the same understanding came to him about God. That sometimes we get to a stoplight in life and we just wonder, why is God not me out of a red light? Why can't I just move ahead? Why can't we just keep moving? We wait a lot in life. We let, wait for a lot of things to take place. We wait on God a lot. We wait for him usually to change our circumstances, to take us to a different place in life. The whole trouble is, is that seldom God seems to be in a hurry at all whatsoever. Now that's the first conclusion I draw from this story of Elizabeth and Zechariah is that we have to wait on God. We have to wait. It sounds easy, wait on God, but if you've experienced the tightness in your chest, you've, the, the anxiety, <clears throat> the fear, the, uh, the uneasiness, as you wait and wait and wait. But waiting is an essential ingredient in seeing God's plan revealed, not only in your life, but for the whole world. Waiting. But we also learn that God is faithful to keep his promises. We learn that from this story. Zechariah and Elizabeth waited a lifetime for John. They waited a lifetime for this, this young baby. But it was John who described later when he was talking, but it was John who Jesus described later who said, no, he's the greatest man born of woman. Would you say he was worth the wait? Would you say that John was worth the wait to Elizabeth and Zechariah? Was he worth the wait to Jesus? Was he worth the wait to the world? The answer is yes. You see, God made a promise to Israel. Even before the 400 silent years, he had made a promise that he would send the Savior, and he kept that. He made a promise to Zechariah and Elizabeth that, that they would have a son and that he would be John and he would do great things in the world. And he kept that promise. While this was going on, God was making a promise through an angel to, to Mary and to Joseph that they would give birth to Jesus Christ. And he kept that promise. And he's going to keep every promise that he's ever made. Every promise he's ever made to you and I. Well, there's one more thing that I want to draw a conclusion of. Waiting eventually gives way to joy. Waiting gives way to joy. Christmas comes, but it never leaves. It comes, but it never leaves. You know, there is such a documented thing as Christmas or post-Christmas depression. All the hype is gone. The build-up to this holiday, this Christmas, uh, the, 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 all the paper, the presents have been unwrapped. The paper's been thrown away. The tree comes down. The decorations are put away to another year. The thrill of something new fades as it gets older. The family goes home, and before you know it, we're back to our normal way of life. But that's really not what Christmas is. That may be what we've done to Christmas, or made it into, but that's not what Christmas really is. This is not what the, that is not what the world waited for, has waited for all eternity, for it to happen. That's not what we waited for. Sometimes we just have to have a time, a period, a year, an event in our life that just reminds us what Christmas really is. Ravi Zacharias uh, wrote and told of a story that they always spent their Christmases at his in-laws, and he loved being with them, and they were wonderful people, and they were always caring people. And on this one Christmas, 
his mother-in-law uh, wanted to invite someone to be. And I think she did this a lot of times. On this particular year, she wanted to invite someone that wouldn't have a Christmas family to be with to share Christmas with their family. And she asked a gentleman from their church who was a loner, uh, and by everybody's admitted <laughs> uh, thoughts on him, he was a little odd. And she invited him. And Ravi didn't like that. He said, I travel so much and I stay on the run so much and I have so many speaking engagements that when it comes to Christmas, I want it just with my family. I want it just to be us. And he says, I'm very protective of that. But now there was going to be a stranger in the midst and it was going to change everything. And he was resentful of it. And of course, with God's sense of humor, as it turned out, Ravi was the one who was tasked with entertaining this gentleman. And he found out he was a very, very nice gentleman. He was very well read. He loved to discuss deep theological issues. And Ravi said, I do too, but not on Christmas. And he says, and as they got through the evening and we come to the draw at the end of the evening, that the man put his coat and hat on and went around to each person and said to them personally this, thank you for the best Christmas of my life. I will never forget it. And he says he walked out that front door and disappeared into the darkness. And Ravi realized then what Christmas really was and what, what he had made it to be. Sometimes we need to be reminded of what Christmas really is. Hey, let me just say this to you. Don't let the low-flying planes take Christmas away from you. Don't let the low-flying planes distract you from what's really important in this life. It may be December 27th, but Christmas is not gone. And when the poinsettias are gone and the trees are gone and all the presents are gone, the real gift of Christmas remains and will always be here. 2020 will soon come to an end. The same thing will happen with 2021. Time passes, but the gift of God is eternal. This Christmas, please know that God keeps his promises. And as we wait on him to reveal and change our circumstances, may we hold on to that truth. God bless you all, and Merry Christmas.